Awesome. Cool. So anything come up over just the lunch break? I mean, Lana, you mentioned some stuff, uh, working, meditating with your food. <laughs> That's great. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you could, you could see that, you know, you, you're, you're, when you're hungry, right, it's, it tastes good. But as you go through it, it kind of dwindles out and your last, your last pieces, you don't even notice <laughs> that they just yeah. go in. It's true. Yeah. If you're like me, I'm trying to get the first piece in like the 30th bite, <laughs> which is not good because that's how you get a belly sometimes. <laughs> Um, cool. Anyone else? Anything? Uh, just, I mean, it doesn't have to be around food, but anything that just came up, any reflections from the morning section or a portion of, of today? Not for me. Not, not too much, Lou? No. All right. All right. So let's jump in. I just want to open some notes. So I just wanted to start by, um, it's raining here now. So Let's cross our fingers. The power stays on, <laughs> but you'll know because I'll drop and then I'll try to call through the, um, the power drops. I'll try to call through the phone. Um, so just repeating um, what we ended on before, what, which were sort of like methodologies for working with attachment. And, and I hope, you know, I think, I think just in general, I hope the conversation we had this morning um just provided some in and of itself. I mean, there's some that are just implicit uh, in Buddhism, meaning when we, when we start to understand this mechanism of, of how we're entangled in samsara, that can actually lessen the attachment. And, and so we see how the Buddha's teaching uh, on various levels is so skillful because it really provides various entry points as well as like a, a scope of wisdom and, and insight that can grow that does lessen our attachment, right? And so even, even the way the Buddha, the Buddha looked was for the purpose of lessening attachment. So it's very interesting when we start to look at the Buddha's path like this because we start to see, um, first, what is attachment? Just repeating that, that definition, you know, one definition of it, which is a, a, a state of mind or a state of being that exaggerates the pleasing qualities of a pleasurable object, right? And so, you know, even the, the design of robes for monastics, you can see, you know, in what the Buddha wore, um, you could see it's designed to reduce attachment, right? Because there's no, you know, there's no, uh, um, you know, they're not bedazzled, you know, there's no like jewelry on, there's no things that typically as human beings increases our, our um, a thirst for, for more physical kind of, uh, objects of adornment right so basically what i'm what i'm trying to say is that you know everything we study in the buddha dharma can be a way to understand attachment to then want to reduce it right and want to eliminate it um mary Jo, one of the things we did talk about in the morning um was very much like my belief that attachment like depending on how much we struggle with attachment this has nothing to do with whether we're a good or bad person from a from a from my belief within the buddhist path um it does affect if we, how we experience life meaning whether we experience more or less suffering so there is an impact and i think the impact in the buddha dharma is always on karmic repercussions or or the repercussions of seeds we take action on or seeds we plant right um and habit patterns so we talked a lot this morning about buddha nature we talked a lot about that being the basis for understanding that our nature actually doesn't have attachment as part of it from a buddhist perspective from a mayana buddhist perspective though because we're not abiding in that buddha nature we experience attachment aversion all kinds of other afflictive emotions and delusions as well as misperceptions about self which would be the root of attachment. So, so before we went to break, we were really kind of focusing in on then like different methods for working with attachment, but I really wanted to center this. I, I view the entire Buddha Dharma as a method for working with attachment, right? So I, is that, does that resonate? Is that coming across? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. So, so that's where I think it gets very rich because anytime we, re- we, we study, we reflect, we meditate on the Dharma, then there is always an approach where we have to look at how our attachment and aversion is functioning how, and then eventually how we're relating to self, how we're relating to the personalization of perception or an experience, right? It's another way to talk about um, mm-hmm. uh, self cleaning. Could everyone just mute themselves? I'd appreciate it, even if you don't have that much background noise. Unless, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Um, great. So, um, so with that said, I, I would kind of say, like, I didn't actually say that earlier, but I would say that is the whole, the whole Buddha Dharma is a method. I and mean, when we look at the Buddhist path, the whole thing is a skillful means for recognizing. First, that aversion, attachment, and clinging to self are harming us and others. Secondly, how to get out of that, you know, how to remedy that, right? And so the remedy is in the path itself. The remedy is in the teaching itself. Um, Even hearing it is a type of remedy. Um, I like one analogy I've heard a Buddhist teacher use where he said, he said, a lot of the Buddhist teachings are skillful means to coax coax us off of a cliff and he used an analogy of a like a small child you know uh like like one or two years old or something and they're 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 walking towards a cliff and you know you're on the other side waving like a doll or some kind of toy at them to try to coax them away from the cliff right and so he was equating it's a really cool analogy he was equating i mean not that that can happen to a child but it's cool when you (laughs) reference it to buddhism he was saying a lot of the Buddhist teachings are really that toy. You know, it's that toy or that shiny thing, you know, flashing at us, trying to coax us off the cliff of, of samsaric entanglement, right? And he's not also demeaning the Dharma through that. He's just saying a lot of the Dharma is a skillful means. It's not an absolute. We can see like a lot of the Dharma path uh, we would call, um, we wouldn't call definitive. Right? We would call it interpretive. So in, in the, when we get into studying uh, the sutras and the, and the commentaries or the shastras on sutras, we, we really get into this conversation on what is definitive, meaning what is direct, and what is um, up for interpretation. Right? So, so teachings on karma are actually not definitive because karma is a relative truth. It's, it's an illusory phenomena. But of course, what kind of predicament will, would we be in if... If we were never taught about karma, cause, and effect, we wouldn't understand, you know, the mechanisms of cause and effect and how to affect our own suffering and happiness. So it's an important uh, interpretive teaching. Uh, We talked about vows. Vows are not a definitive thing. They're a skillful means, right? Like, so I'll give you an example. Um, Some vows relate to like a more direct teaching in something that's going to cause direct suffering. Like for instance, the, uh, the vow to avoid killing another human being or another being in general, this would, obviously this has a karmic repercussion uh, for ourselves if we do that, but it also harms another person within the monastic vows. There's some vows that actually have nothing to do their, with their, their, a prescri- you know, there's their prescribed rule to help, monastics train their mind so for instance um fully ordained monastics you know are not allowed to um, stand up and use the bathroom right because this was there was a risk at the time of the buddha that you know even like lay practitioners or even just householders wouldn't do that kind of thing it was inappropriate so if a, if a monastic did, did that then it would make the Sangha look bad. It would also, and it would, people would lose respect for the Dharma and the Sangha. So again, is it bad to stand up and use the bathroom? No, you know, that's a cultural value. But within the vows, there was a skillful means of putting it forward. So this also has to do with, with direct and expedient. Um, so going back to this analogy of like coaxing, you know, us off the cliff, the whole entire Buddha Dharma is to help us work with our attachment. And to help us work with our aversion. You know, we established already that aversion is easier to work with, right? I think for all of us here on the call, Mary and Joe, we were talking about that. Is, is it easier to work with aversion or attachment? And most of us, or all of us, concluded it's much easier to work with anger because it feels bad, 
You know, it's something that we immediately feel a repercussion tension. There's a health consequence of long-term anger. And then uh, where attachment is more sneaky because it's something pleasurable that feel that feels good initially and then starts to feel bad or less good over time. So we can talk more about this expedient direct because I think it's important if you if you all want to talk about that. But nonetheless, going into these other methods, we find a skillful means. I talked about reflecting on impermanence, right? Um, oh, there we go. I talked about reflecting on impermanence reflecting on um, the fuller nature of an object or the object of attachment. So reflecting on, you know, okay, this, this, this cupcake or this cookie or piece of chocolate looks a certain way to me, but how can I reflect on it deeper to see the other aspects of it? I mean, in the emptiness teachings, this comes indirectly because when we meditate analytically on emptiness, Sometimes we're looking at the, the, the parts of something, you know, we're breaking something down into interdependent parts and immediately what that, what that can do for us besides, you know, if it doesn't introduce non-duality, it can introduce impermanence and it can and in, introduce change and our attachment starts to lessen because we start to see, oh, this isn't this one thing that my mind thinks of it as, right? And so we start to open up the perspective. So really putting it simply, this, this aspect or, or method of reflecting on the fuller nature of an object of attachment is really trying to open our perspective. Another way to think of this is to challenge our limiting beliefs. And around this, we talked about resistance that can come up. So that, that can also be something we need to bring into the practice when we're challenging a limiting belief. We might not want to challenge it because maybe it's a very long held belief. Or we're afraid to lose the pleasure. You know, maybe we're afraid to lose our connection to something we really enjoy or something that we've been holding on to as, you know, a lot of our parts of our life we don't enjoy. And there's that one part we enjoy. So this can be challenging. I just want to acknowledge that. So the third was strengthening, strengthening our discernment. And strengthening our discernment really happens via all of these practices, but really via the second one, when we're we're, we're being more discerning about what something is, right? And when there's discernment, this is an antidote. This is the direct antidote to attachment from a conceptual level. Then we have um, in inquiry, right? Which is part of, you know, just part of the whole, what I've been talking about. Any kind of inquiry, open questions, curiosity that we can invite into the process of reflection around an object of attachment, right? For me, this can these th this is often very simple questions like, "Hmm, I wonder about that," or "Or how is this?" or "Is it really like that?" You know, just really open questions that let me reflect without pressure. Um, this was kind of one thing that came up in the morning that I that I talked about, which was um, I, I I'm sharing my experience and belief because I don't want to just present an analytical only philosophical view. So if some of you are wondering why I'm talking so much about myself, that's the reason that's part of my teaching style. Not because I need to talk about myself necessarily. I just find it helpful in our dynamic and dialogue when we're really trying to get to our own personal experiences here. And so um, often it's, it's the inquiry that helps me on a personal level to open up the richer intent of the dharma where blind belief of like even the even the belief that attachment is bad i actually think this has to be questioned on a personal level because if we just simply say oh the buddha said it's bad therefore it's bad this is a very limited we're going to get a very limited result out of that it's a start because maybe we we need someone who we trust to, to advise us, right? The Buddha, the Buddha, and our, our teachers and our lamas and uh, uh, all of the the lineage, um, they are they are advisors. You know, they're they are sane advisors. You know, I would say like more than sane, right? When they when they have developed their realization, but it doesn't mean we're it's going to do justice to us to immediately take their belief on face value or, or what they say on face value. And I say this with love and. A lot of devotion, you know, for me, I, I also have a lot of devotion for my teachers in the lineage. But what I found is 
um, some of my teacher's best teaching are when they're inviting me into a process rather than just telling me what to do. Because telling us what to do, that's sometimes what we want. Our attachment wants to take the lazy way and just say, okay, tell me what to do. This is not where Buddha Dharma thrives, in my opinion, right? This can only get you so far. So in inquiry really helps and treating um, the Dharma as an open book that we, we, we can take advice from, but we could also ask questions to. And this doesn't mean so much like doubt or skepticism. It's more just being open, right? Being open. So I, I kind of, I was thinking over the break, even about attachment in the sense that like, there's some attachments you know, we're all framing attachment here like it's bad and something that needs to get something that we need to get rid of. So far, we've been talking about it like that. But I'm just giving an example here. When we open a question, well, is it really bad? We can see some attachments are not bad. And I'll give you an example. An attachment to wanting to wake up for us right now. I mean, I don't know where you are in your practice, but for me, it's a good thing. You know, I need some kind of desire. Let's just use the word desire to separate it a little bit. I need desire to want to attain awakening at this point. I need some desire to want to practice, to want to engage in teaching or study or, or dialogue, um, to listen to the Dharma. I need a desire to do that. Um, I need a desire even to reduce desire. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, we need, we, and, and sometimes we can separate out the word attachment from desire, but they're, they're, all, they're very similar. They're kind of around the same thing. So, so here we have to look very specifically, what is it about the attachment that makes it destructive? And what is it that we need as a skillful means along the path? So ultimately, in the, I'm just going to use the Vajra Cutter Sutra as an example, because it's fresh, because I'm teaching it the last two months, three months. So the Vajra Cutter Sutra is pretty clear. You know, there's some, some verses in there that say, you know, when you, when you, when you reach the other shore, it's like sort of, well, it's talking about dharma and non-dharma in one verse, meaning um, having clinging to existence or non-existence. And then it goes into sort of like this, this other quote from the Buddha uh, uh, that is common in other sutras around, you know, the dharma being the boat and going from one shore to the other, right? And when you've gone to the other shore, you know, the shore of awakening, um, you don't drag, the, you know, you don't take the boat with you. So the, the Buddha makes a comment of, you know, if you if you don't even have clinging to the dharma at a certain point, why would you have clinging to non-dharma? And what he means is non-existence. He's talking about nihilism. But anyways, I'm just using it as a point. So, so in the teachings, it's direct that at a certain point, bodhisattvas abandon the clinging and attachment to the dharma. But is that a smart thing for you to do right now? I'm guessing probably not, right? <laughs> so that's, you know, so these are things to be reflected on. So I, so... This is what happens when we set up inquiry as opposed to belief. Now, belief or conviction can come from inquiry, which is very important. Remember, I told you earlier, I quoted His Holiness Dalai Lama. Uh, I you know, paraphrased what he said, which is basically um, belief in, in, in at least the Nalanda tradition of, of you know, coming from the Nalanda tradition in Tibetan Buddhism is based on reasoning in general. In Vajrayana Buddhism, there's slightly some different their blind belief can take place in Vajrayana Buddhism, but that's, we're not talking about that today. So, so reasoned belief. And so what is that belief really? It's really a conviction based on one's own experience, right? So the conviction that you all have today and, and we're, we're sharing today about attachment that, you know, this, this definition of attachment as something that exaggerates the pleasing qualities of a pleasurable object, and then that becomes suffering. That belief, I'm assuming, is based on some kind of conviction from your side, right? Uh, definitely from my side, there's conviction in that. Why? Because I looked at it. I've been inquiring into that for 22 years, you know? I've been studying it, all, all of the above, right? And does that mean my conviction is finished? No. If my conviction was finished, I would not be engaging in attachment anymore. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of dilemma of of the buddhist awakening process it's sort of like we have these these levels of of growth and awareness where i think the first conviction is just this is harming me and others and i want to change that 
The next conviction, which is the hardest step, is moving into the experience of changing that. Then we need to move into the, like I said, the unchanging realization where that's no longer an effortful act. And so we established already, that's why in order to cut the root of attachment, we have to realize non-duality or Buddha, what I call, you know, Mahayana non-duality, the view of emptiness. This realization finally cuts that root. And there's, there's just not even a perception or thought of something to be attached to because there's no longer a subject object experience. And this is, this, this happens even for, you know, um, an arhat or, or we could say a first Bhumi Bodhisattva, you know, once they've entered the path of seeing. And of course you and I, we can have moments of this in meditation, you know, until those, those stages. And those are very helpful because then it doesn't just become a belief ideology that we can cut attachment. We start to see it's possible. Right. So that was all around inquiry, just the importance of opening this questioning way of living. I call it inquiry based living for, you know, the, when, I, when I'm on Oprah, I'll talk about that. <laughs> Joking. I don't think I'll ever be on Oprah, nor do I want to, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, it sounds like something that would be on Oprah. Um, so the next method was shamatha. So we already talked about that this morning a little bit. We'll talk more about it now. Uh, Vipassana, um, insight meditation or, or um, special insight meditation. And then uh, we were going to talk about this session, great compassion, meditating on great compassion. And then I also said vows because um, ethical conduct does really affect our attachment. And so I hope this, this framework of what I shared, which is probably, you know, already in your universe, but I'm sharing it just so you understand my point of view so we can uh, understand, you know, relate to this topic in, 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 you know, in a way today, um, that uh, vows are not a means to an end. Vows are a way for us to work with our mind. Vows are a way also to reduce negative karma, accumulate virtue, right? And so when we look at it that way, they're incredibly beneficial for, for working with attachment, for both reducing it and, and eventually eliminating it. Actually, in Tibetan Buddhism, vows, I would say, are, are one of the primary ways we do that, because whether one's a monastic or not, they follow us uh, all the way through the path, you know, through the, what we call these three sets of vows, pratimoksha, bodhisattva, and tantric vows. Tantric vows being the most subtle, being tantric vows are based on mind. Bodhisattva vows are based on, on all three, body, speech, and mind. And monastic and pratimoksha vows are primarily based on body and speech. So just to recap a little bit too, um, awareness was really the threat, right? We, we started talking about awareness as, you know, the beginning, middle, and end. When we talk about shamatha and vipassana, the main two styles of meditation we generally practice in Buddha Dharma, what is it that's in common? Awareness. What is the quality of mind that's being used the most? It's awareness in both of those um, practices in shamatha we're strengthening the awareness in vipassana we're using that we're training that awareness to look at the nature of something to actually break down our misperception right to erode the misperception so any any thoughts questions comments um before i move on more Anything you would add, I guess? I mean, because this is definitely not exhaustive, right? It was just sort of what I came up with off the top of my head that I thought I wanted to cover today. But any, any other methods in Buddha Dharma you would add to counter attachment, just from your own practice, from your own study that we can add to this list? I'm thinking too. I Maybe think off, it's in the right. Sorry. I think he's, I think I think Tundra wants you to go, Lana. I, I think for me it's seen for the object, like meditating on the object of the attachment and see it for what it is. Because at the end of the day, whatever it is. You know, you might get it today and it's not going to be the same thing tomorrow. 
it will change and its meaning to you will change as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. W- would you, do you think that could go into the Vipassana category? Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, no, but it's good. I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about Vipassana a little bit, so that's maybe a good segue too. <laughs> but yeah, it, no, but you, you don't have to agree with that. If you think it could go in its own category, that's fine too. Just for me, that I would think Vipassana. That's part of Vipassana. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't I mean, and then I think Mary Jo had something else. Don't. There's maybe offering practice. You know. If yeah. You transform it. Um, if you can stay absorbed into relating to it differently, relating to it as an offering, um, the more you can stay. I find that at least for periods of time, um, sometimes I can, if I, if I can remember and if I can stay focused, um, then it's helpful. Awesome. Um, any examples of that? Like I can immediately think of like, for me, that would be like mandala offering. I often offer what I'm attached to and things like that. Or just the, or the food offering practices. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. I put it in my notes, offering practices. Perfect. I know for me, uh, the food offering practice is very helpful because mm-hmm. going through that whole causal chain of how it came to be in your hands and seeing all the suffering and everything that, that came into giving you what you have in your hand it turns becomes very powerful after a while. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I've been mandala offering has this sense for me of, um, you know, imagining the whole universe, but it that universe also includes not just the the beautiful things, but it also includes sort of transforming those things that I find difficult or that I'm attached to or that I'm angry about, and this sense of letting it go. You know, there's this, there's a sense of release that can happen in mandala offerings too. So that came to mind. Um, yeah. Mary Jo, did you have something? I saw you raise your hand there. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, you got it. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I would like to hear more about the, the offering uh, way. I, you've mentioned some, and that's something I haven't thought about, really, and I like that idea. Certainly, it's good for me to be connected with all the things that are a part of, you know, what I'm eating or whatever, eating especially, let's say. And um, about, and I have some questions about the mandala. Um, I mean, like the negativity, I mean, would that be like um, uh, people that are expressing hatred toward each other? Are they included in the mandala Uh, and so forth? Um, So the other thing is I'm thinking that the, you know, the way I've been working with attachment just in a very, you know, elementary kind of a way, uh, first of all, is to try to notice what I am attached to because yes. it's uh, very slippery sometimes. And <laughs> I can, I can first of all, notice what I like and likely there is a degree of attachment there and, and what I want more of and, you know, what I think I deserve more of and so forth and so on. Um, so this is good for me to be thinking of, about it a little bit differently, but I think still that is essential for me to understand and to see for myself what some of my own attachments are. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we mentioned that in the morning. That's sort of like the first, the first step in all of this is an awareness of what's going on, you know, an yeah. awareness of like, you know, how that attachment is. Um just to repeat for you, Mary Jo, I, I also mentioned this, the sense of like, there could be different levels of awareness, awareness of thoughts, awareness of sensations related yeah. to attachment, awareness of, of energy movement related to attachment, 
And so there's there's also various levels of how we sense attachment arising. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, being mindful of it is really the first step. Um, did did one of you, Dundrup, or I'll talk about the mandala a little bit more, but Dundrup or, or Lou, did you want to talk about the food offering a little bit? Just because she was asking about it. Um, I mean, FPMT has a whole text, um, fpmt.org in the foundation store. There's a, a whole text on food offering practices. There's different different kinds. There's different prayers, um, different ways. They resonate, different approaches resonate with different people. Some of the approaches are trying to think about it um, in terms of just nourishing the body for practice instead of thinking of it as like self-indulgent. The main, um, some of you know, the, the, the general prayer though is making, turning it into an offering to like one's root teacher, um, you know, transfer like visualizing one's teacher at one's heart. Um, and then, you know, kind of actually offering the food, may, turning the eating of the food, um, you know, blessing the food and thinking of it as nectar and, um, and, you know, and then off making it an offering to one's teacher um, or his holiness or whoever, you know, one feels connected to. And then if you can kind of, so you really, in a way, you transform the entire act of eating into a meditation, you know, assuming that you're like alone and, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard, harder to do in a restaurant or with other people or, you know, can be. Um, I mean, of course, you can do like the initial prayer, but to really stay absorbed in it as a meditation, um, you know, is easier to do when you're alone. But the that's the that's the one that um, I resonate with the most is, and you can even extend that to like um, shopping and you know even thinking about the ingredients, the act of cooking the food. Um, you know, you can think of, that you know you're you're choosing the best ingredients as an offering, um, you're cooking it in order to make it, you know, so you can sort of just transform. Because Buddhism, I think, is really about that, is sort of about finding skillful ways of transforming daily activities. Um, so I really like offering practice. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Sandra. Uh, yeah, and Mary Jo, um, yeah, I mean, just on your question around mandala offering, I think there's kind of two schools on this in the sense, I don't mean literal schools, just sort of maybe a few different ways one can do it. Um, one kind of way is that we we don't offer like dirty things in the mandala offering, meaning like, you know, you don't want to offer things you wouldn't eat yourself or enjoy yourself. So you transform them. So for instance, you know, something ugly becomes a beautiful flower or your anger, you know, or like you were saying, people's anger in the world or things that you find disturbing, you transform into that, you know, Mount Maru kind of pure realm environment, right? So that's kind of one way we visualize the mandala. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself anytime because we're just a small group here. Yeah, if you can find Thank you. I'm having <laughs> difficulty with that button. Um, so, do you transform that just through your thinking? Yeah, exactly. It's through imagination. And so, you know, you would, you would basically imagine that that negative aspect in the world, that, that thing that, that, is, that is disturbing, um, you're mainly offering your impression of it, right? You're not literally offering that. You know, you're offering your experience of it, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, so, you know, I like to keep it personal. So, so for me, you know, I may offer things I'm attached to that are beautiful and things that are maybe not beautiful, like things that are not, I wouldn't consider beautiful, like negative emotions I have or something. I might not, not actually visualize those as a form. I just might offer them up as a non-form, you know? So it, it really depends on what works for you, you know? As a, as a concept, more or less? That's how I do it. Because, you know, for some, I, I'm not, I don't have the wildest imagination. So for me, it's hard to imagine, you know, mm -hmm. um, my anger, for instance, taking a form that's pleasing, mm -hmm. you know. But mm -hmm. 
one of my lamas also recommended, like, you don't have to visualize it as pleasing. Like, the Buddhas are not going to be offended by that, you know? Like, because who are we offering mm -hmm. the mandala to? We're offering it to the merit field of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Arhats, Yidam Deities, Dakinis, etc., and Tantra, uh, Gurus. And then um, in the... And then on the, the relative level, we're offering to all sentient beings that it becomes the object of something beneficial for them. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, the motivation is the same. The Buddhas, actually, enlightened beings can't perceive something that is suffering, suffering by nature, meaning they can see that we're suffering through something, but they don't see it that way. They don't actually perceive it that way. This is kind of getting into more um, detailed Buddhist philosophy, but nonetheless, um, we can, whatever feels better, if you want to like transform it into a pleasing thing, like a beautiful flower or food offering or something like mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. in your mind and imagine and visualize it, that's cool. If you just want to let go of the concept, that's also an offering, you know, mm -hmm. like you're, you know, the main attitude is we're releasing the, the, the thing that we, um, that we fear that we're attached to that we're angry towards, you know, so so it sounds like you have your own aversion to when people, when there's a lot of anger, right. In the world yeah. is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So you would release your aversion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I think in a way, in a way, I think there's room for like, you know, imagining like a sacred world, like a world, an enlightened world we would want to see, you know, but it's more, a mandala is more about, um, offering it's more about releasing attachment it's more about giving generosity at its essence at its root like if we think about a mandala offering before a teaching you know we're often making that with a request to uh -huh. teach the dharma so there's a sense of like generosity offering everything up body speech mind you know pleasing things and then that accumulates merit for the teaching yeah but when we do it as a practice, sometimes we accumulate and 100. I, Go ahead, yeah. I would think it also would create sort of an empty space so that you could receive better, it seems. Exactly. Um, but I, uh, I want to go just step back. I don't, believe me, I, I don't seem to harbor a lot of anger a lot of times. But sometimes I just catch myself in a negative day. And uh, I kind of envision myself with just a black cloud over me. And uh, I'm kind of wondering if that could be offered up in that way. I mean, in the past, I have visualized it, you know, just kind of zapping it out into the black hole or something in the universe uh, where it wouldn't perpetuate onward. But what do you think about um, offering that to the Buddha? Sure. I think why not? You know, why not? And then and then as you offer it up, you're it's good to reflect on like, what is it? What is it that you want relief from? You know, and then it comes back to the afflictive emotions like attachment, aversion, jealousy, pride, etc. So so it might be connected to one of those. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. so you, you get so so Dharma always I don't know if always, but we, we want to try to connect it to how it's relating to mind emotion etc right? yeah but good definitely you can offer it up i don't see why not yeah 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 and, and what else are you releasing around it that's what i would have you don't have to tell me but you can reflect on that you know yeah. how you are what tell me oh again, i was how saying you, what? You, you could offer up that black cloud and then you could also reflect on what you what you yeah. want to release around that black cloud like like what is your relationship to it you know what why is it you know really you know releasing deeper emotions around it deeper ways of how you're relating to it but you can reflect on that you know yeah yeah yes yes sometimes you have to dig around you know yeah yeah exactly yeah thank you yeah and, and you're welcome and i like what you said about opening up space because that's exactly what happens when, when we when we do mandala offerings, we, we accumulate it sometimes with what's what's called the nundro, the the preliminary practices for for tantric practice. Um, and we um, when we accumulate it a lot, what you start to notice on an experiential level is it opens up space. It brings merit, you know. So there's kind of like 
groundedness and openness to the Dharma, but there's also just a little more space in one's mind. And um, we talked about that earlier, actually, as sort of like, I was asking at the, I think at the beginning of today, like, what is the opposite of attachment? You know, I mean, we, we said discernment, but what does that feel like? If you, it opens up space, you know, it was one thing we, we came up with. Yeah, good. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um, so we have about 45 minutes, a little bit more. And um, we could do a little more practice if you all want, or if you, if you want more kind of teaching slash dialogue, that's also fine with me. Um, do you want, I know we were talking, I told, I, I said I would go back to um, this uh, shamatha without support uh, practice, because I know Lou and, and Lana, I'm assuming, I mean, you guys had, it was challenging, but you guys enjoyed exploring that or? <laughs> Not sure. I can't hear you or understand you, or maybe the words are not familiar to me, but I have a weak signal, signal sometimes, and it's a little bit garbled. So please, okay. could you just repeat that sentence? We were, were talking about a, a, a shamatha practice earlier, okay. and we're, we're just, just asking, I'm asking Lana and Lou if they're, they want to explore that more, because we were going to come back to that as a way to work with attachment. Yeah, that would be great. Because okay. it's <laughs> to get outside of your comfort zone and push your limits out. Cool. Feel good to everyone else, Thunder Blue? <laughs> Blue's like, oh, I'm not sure, but okay. <laughs> and Mary Jo, I'll, I'll, Mary Jo, you'll just, <laughs> you're flexible. Cool. I'll fill you in as, as we go. Yeah, you all yeah, can hear please. me okay in general? The sounds okay? Okay. So I'm just going to talk about it for a few minutes and then and then we'll do some practice and then I'll I'll guide it a little bit. So so what I'm going to kind of advise you all. So Mary Jo, now what we're kind of building on is um this this premise that that I put forward that really any work with attachment or any kind of any one of the afflictive emotions is going to need to come out of a strengthening of awareness. And so I described awareness earlier as um, a quality of watchfulness in the mind. Um, we could, we could also talk about it as a quality of knowing we're knowing, right? So there's a quality of, of knowing, but there's, a knowing of that, right? So as an example, when we were meditating on the breath, there's a knowing of the breath, right? Which is kind of just a, you know, you could say a direct knowing perceptive through perception. Then there's the awareness that's watching that experience. So sometimes we call it the double knowing. It's a little confusing, but you know, if that's confusing, you can just stay with the sense of watchfulness. So this is a part of the mind that we need to experience via meditation. So the Buddha, the Buddha kind of typically kind of prescribed how to connect with that awareness first by using an object, because when we use an object and when we focus on an object, that's not quite the full meditative awareness practice as I described, but it gets us in the door because what, what starts to happen is the, the thinking mind starts to settle we start to develop attention to the present moment via an object. And then we can start to notice that aware quality of mind. So I'm calling it a quality, right? So it's, it's, it's a part of the mind. It's something that we're not usually, uh, it's, it's not like naturally strong. You know, it depends on the person, but it's usually not naturally strong. It's something we need to strengthen through shamatha practice or meditative awareness practice. So, so what I would advise you is we're just kind of going through the practice now for probably a 15 minute practice or something. It's just, just try to drop a sense of like, I need to find awareness. So, you know, it doesn't help to be tense about it, but what you want to be doing is kind of looking back at the mind, a little bit, looking for that sense of watchfulness, that quality of the mind that can bear witness to your experience. Does that resonate? I can use some other language if that doesn't make sense. I'm just trying to use words to point to it. But do those words 
resonate? Lou? Yeah, Mana? Cool, good, don't drip, all good. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's kind of, it's hard to describe awareness because what is it? It's not just knowing something, it's a bearing witness where there's an observer of something. But I like um, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Um, he's, he was very precise with words, was one of his strengths. And uh, especially English, because he, he, he was very precise the way he translated Tibetan, from, uh, Tibetan to English. And he liked the word watchfulness. And, and I thought about this a lot, where you know, you'll hear people talk about the observer in meditation or watching or, you know, witnessing or something like this. Or, you know, and he said, watching isn't enough. We have to say watchfulness. Because it's a, it's a space of being, right? He didn't say that. I'm adding that now. Because what is the nest part, right? It's not just being watchful. There's a watchfulness that we're sustaining. So we're sustaining the awareness in and of itself. So I liked his definition. I thought it was more precise for meditation language. And so, you know, that's about all I'll say on it. Um, I think... Sometimes we need to sift through our experience to connect with watchfulness or to connect with awareness. So we sometimes just have to relax and let it, let it come. Like I said, if, you, if you're having trouble connecting with awareness, then just go back to an object, go back to the breath, go back to uh, um, an anchor for the practice and just come back to the moment. Use that to kind of come to the present moment. And within the present moment, the quality of mind that's also there is awareness. Now, for those of you who already have a connection to awareness, and this isn't sort of that much of a stretch for you, within shamatha without support, there's a quality of mind that awareness is sustaining or resting on. And that we call the clarity aspect of mind. So mind actually has, uh, we could, we could, has many kind of ways to describe mind, but we can describe it in four aspects or, or four qualities the thinking mind the knowing mind so number one thinking number two the knowing mind number three awareness like what we've been talking about and number four clarity the, cl the clarity aspect of mind so you know how we define mind generally in mayana buddhism is clear and knowing right like when you look at the definition of, of shepa of mind there's many words for mind in Tibetan, so it can get confusing sometimes. But shepa basically refers to a kind of dualistic mind. And the root of shepa is clear and knowing. So, so it's that clear aspect that um, we end up resting the awareness on in Mahamudra Shamatha. That's what I'm kind of, basically, I wanted to make our main meditation teaching today. Um, so again, don't worry too much about like trying to find clarity. Clarity comes eventually, meaning like when the mind is able to settle and we just rest in nowness with awareness without an object, the clear aspect of mind is there. It's always there. It doesn't go anywhere. And that clear aspect of mind is simply just our potential to perceive, our potential to know. So it's, it's, the, it's the relative nature of mind, we could call it. So in shamatha, Mahamudra shamatha, we work with the relative nature of mind so again this is a bit beyond our scope of of today's workshop on attachment but the reason i brought it in is because um you know if we're going to work with the energy of attachment we need to have awareness and we need to strengthen that awareness and we need to allow the mind to move in my opinion right meaning if we're suppressing the mind all the time and squashing it and we're suppressing the attachment we're not going to be able to know its nature because later in vipassana practice we look back at the attachment and we try to find its inherent or true existence or independent existence. That's what Vipassana practice does. But in the shamatha practice, we first need to let it, to be able to observe it, to let it move, and to also know stillness without attachment. So in Mahamudra shamatha, we work with stillness and the movement of mind, meaning the movement of thoughts, more or less. And attachment here could be more than a thought, and that's okay too, but any kind of movement, sensation, energy, thought, etc. Does that sound okay up till now? Yeah? Everyone's following? Okay, let's practice. <laughs> and I'll guide, I'll guide a little bit. 
So just take a moment to uh, just find an upright posture. I'm trusting you all know generally uh, sort of a posture for shamatha meditation. The main two things are to keep a straight back as much as you can. And it's actually not straight. It just means upright because the spine actually doesn't need to literally straighten. And then how you place the head or chin just slightly down and the hands. So you can either form this mudra of meditation or I like to just place my hands on my knees. And generally we practice um, open awareness with the eyes half open or fully open. So if that's too new for you or awkward, you can close your eyes, but see if you can work up to that. And we're just going to start by resting in the body. So I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of a way into open awareness or shamatha without support practice. So just find somewhere in the body to put your attention. The feet, the legs, the feeling of the seat below you. That's going to become like our loose object of shamatha. So we're just going to use the body as an object. And so I'm going to guide you through what looks like a um, body scan, but it's it actually has a slightly different purpose. So just navigating to the feet. Now we're going to have something very deliberate for the next five minutes. Navigating to the feet. Just finding an attention of feet, the sensation of the feet touching the ground below you. The connection of the feet to the earth and the floor below you. Placing about 80% of your attention there. And if you can, try to find the inner space of the feet as well. So not just the skin in relation to the floor or the sides of the feet or top of the feet, but all the way inside where the bone sits. If you can find your awareness and attention inside of the feet both at the same time. And the same as we begin to move up through the calves into the knees, finding the space of both knees at the same time. There's both an awareness of the outer aspect of the body and starting to feel the space or inner space of the body, which is a bit more abstract, not something you might feel directly, but just find yourself living from that space. So living with inside of the knees, for instance. Same as you move into the upper legs. your sits bones, connection of your body to the seat, and your hips and lower abdomen. Now that we find ourselves in the main trunk of the body, sensing the middle of the body. So first find with your awareness, the feeling of maybe the front of your abdomen, maybe the breath, Expanding the abdomen in and out, the sides, back, all the way into sensing the middle now where your spine sits. So now this is the inner space of the body where your organs sit, but right now you're just allowing your awareness, attention to live from within that part of your body. So there's a sense of abiding there. And there's also a sense of space, physical. Same as we go up into the mid-body, 
traveling up in front of the spine. Always in connection with the front, back, sides of the body, and also this middle space. Whatever is arising in the body, see if you can allow it to arise and fall. So if, some, if it's something comfortable, uncomfortable, neutral, see if you can just allow. You don't have to get involved. It's painful to be in one area. You can move on to. And from the mid-body, we'll move into the chest now. In front of the heart, the not the heart muscle, but the spiritual heart in the center. The sides to the back of the heart space, all the way into the middle, just sensing the space in your body. The same in your shoulders, inhabiting the space of both shoulders at the same time. The arms down into the fingers, inhabiting the space of the arms and fingers. And back into the throat, sensing the front, the back, the sides, the inner space of the throat where your larynx sits. And by this point, you should be sensing the body a little bit at whatever level you can. There's a whole set of somatic practices I like to teach just connected to the body. But of course, we all come at that from different vantage points and accessibility. So just try your best. The anchor is the body here. So we can come back to that every time we start getting distracted. And the point here is not to think about the body. I'm asking you to in inhabit it, to feel it much as you can. <clears throat> From the throat, we'll move into the head now, but not just anywhere in the head. We're going to move to the middle of the head where the brain sits. And one way to help reference yourself here is to imagine looking back at the middle of the head from the forehead. So you kind of hone in on a point in the forehead and then look back at yourself from there. So look back towards the middle of the head from that point. Similar to the rest of our practice, sensing the sides, the front, the back, the muscles of the face, eyes, nose, jaw. Now we're inhabiting the space of the head. And if you want, I, if you like this practice, I recommend doing a little slower on your own and doing a little quicker today, just for the sake of time. You can go through more slowly. But for now, we're going to inhabit the space of the entire body. So we've actually scanned up from the feet to the head. Now just allow yourself to gently scan back down, but don't lose the previous part. So as you're scanning into the throat and neck, don't lose the connection to the space within the head. And the same as you move into the shoulders, arms, hands chest, mid body, lower abdomen, abdomen, down into the hips, your seat, legs, knees, all the way down into the calves, and eventually finding your feet back down on the earth. Now see if you can feel your entire body connected to this earth below you. So it's not just the feet, it's all of it. And it's not just the outer portions of the body. There's a deep connection to the inner space of the body. Almost as if you're sitting inside a room. So you actually feel yourself embodied within the room of your body or the temple of your body. And just sit there for a moment. See if you can rest into that now. So bringing in practices of it's not quite relaxation i call it rest because we're just resting with a sensation or an experience or an emotion or whatever's arising but there is an element of release that happens here so allow yourself to release 
into this, into a sense of yourself within the body as a whole. And from within that, you can start to sense the space around you. And this you're doing not with your eyes, but with your feeling. So without coming out of the body, you invite the space in the room to meet your inner space in the body. So you find yourself sitting in the room of the body, but also in the room you're sitting in. So there's a deeply felt perspective here. There's perspective, there's relationship on a feeling level. And it's made of space. It's made of it's a relaxed, warm space. And just in a moment, for those of you who have your eyes closed, we're going to actually open them, but we're going to continue to practice and now shifting into an open awareness practice. So as you open your eyes, you just allow your gaze to rest in space, not staring at any particular object, more staring in space, just like you've been inhabiting the space of your body. And you can also open the eyes halfway if that's easier. Just allow the eyes to rest like you're allowing your body to rest. And now just connect with the space. And there's an awareness. There's a quality of mind that's knowing you're knowing that space. There's a sense of watchfulness. Just be the watchfulness. And so we'll do this for another five or so minutes, just being the watchfulness. And when you lose that sense of watchfulness, just recognize that. And as soon as you recognize it, you're back in the watchfulness. You're back in the sense of awareness. So we're really just resting with awareness. And the body is a very light anchor for this. But use the spaciousness we cultivated to now connect with the spaciousness of mind, the sense of clarity and awareness. And you just gently sustain that with mindfulness. Not so heavy handed. There's nothing to push. There's nothing to force. And just gently allowing the awareness to be. When you become distracted, just recognize that awareness again, recognize that open spaciousness and become aware of that. And don't try to hold it for too long. It's a little bit different than like a single pointed concentration practice where we kind of apply some forcefulness here. You just want to relax, but don't lose the awareness. As soon as the awareness is gone, we recognize and just try to sustain that gently again. You might have to do that every 30 seconds, every minute. That's okay. We're not trying to force it. It's that process of the recognition that actually strengthens it as well. Just like when we lift weights, there's the, there's the sort of benefit we get from, from 
lifting the weight up and also lowering it down. It's the same here. It's a benefit we get from recognizing when we're distracted. That recognition is the awareness. Just do this for a few more minutes. And so noticing sound, noticing something in your field of vision or noticing a smell or sensation, that's not getting distracted. Just noticing in itself is not distraction. It's when that produces a string of thought proliferation. So we're just simply allowing things to be. And there's this quality of awareness that we're sustaining throughout. And there's this clarity of mind that's simply just the light of mind. So it's just there. We don't have to bring clarity. It's already there. And just as we start to close the practice, what's one of the I think incredibly beneficial things of this style of shamatha is your eyes are open. So we can begin to look, we can begin to move without, you know, deliberately coming out of the practice. Try to stay with awareness. Try to continue it as you move your head around and look around the room. So now deliberately just start to look around and see if you can carry that awareness with you. Again, it's not awareness of what you see, it's that seeing can happen. Well, we're just simply resting with clarity and awareness. Sound can happen while we're resting with clarity and awareness. This comes very beneficial, bringing meditation or meditative awareness into life. One more. Okay, thanks so much. Blue looks like a it's challenging uh, exercise. <laughs> so deep, I, deep breath out. I was with you all the way. It's like open by eyes. Oh yeah, well that's a big part of it. So so eyes um, eyes have a lot of um, how do you say it? They have a big effect on how we relate to the mind. So, so typically in, in Tibetan Buddhist meditation, we, we generally don't close the eyes at all. Uh, they're either half open or, or fully open. The, the really, I mean, how, I would say most in the Gluk tradition, I usually see people with half open. But the Dalai Lama, his eyes are pretty, they're pretty open when he, when he meditates, you know. Yeah, and, and with this style of shamatha, it's really 
uh, it's really focusing on more more fresh freshness awakeness within the meditation so we're not closing down the senses where when we close down the senses sometimes we 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 also bring a lot of dullness into the practice and it's harder to connect with these these aspects of mind but nonetheless for some people you know the mind is very active so that helps them initially right so it's not like a bad thing it's just sort of something you want to you want to try to work on i usually recommend to people um, just just do a session where part of the session eyes are closed, part of the session eyes are half open, and then kind of like get used to it a little bit more. Yeah. It's very helpful. I mean, it's not like a, a thing you have to be worried about or, or how do you say it? I don't want to put a bee in your bonnet, but I, I, I know how helpful it is. That's why I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Because it also really helps us to stay awake. You know, I think it took me about six months to really switch from half open eyed meditation to fully open a while back, maybe 12 or 12 or 13 years ago. And um, that was painful. I mean, it was challenging. And then just the benefits were so, so great. I never really went back. I, I do even visualization meditation often with the eyes open. Yeah, the Dalai Lama actually was recommending when it comes to visualization, having the eyes open. He's saying there's another aspect that comes when we train like that. So there's there's reasons for this. How the how the senses work with the mind. You know, we we kind of hack those things in Buddhism sometimes. You know, we hack our our biology. Anywho, no no worries, uh, Lou. You just keep going. <laughs> but did, were you able to connect with awareness? That's really the main thing. I think so. Cool. That's enough. <laughs> great answer anyone else just want to share what came up or any questions from the practice I'm not used to meditate with my eyes open but I noticed it was almost easier to the, you know the mind was really calm which was almost counterintuitive because I thought oh my god if I'm going to have my eyes open all kinds of stuff will come up because you know um, I'll be feeding myself the visual images right to the mind but that did not happen it was really 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 calm you know awesome. and it, it was there but it was kind of the best I can describe it was flickering in and out you know but it was almost easy very interesting cool yeah so it, the, that's a great um, that's great feedback for yourself because you you see kind of like this is a possibility for you. It's actually not as maybe hard as, as you thought it was. And some people it's a little more challenging to get used. We can all get used to it. For some people it's more challenging because the eyes really like bring up more thoughts. But for you it sounded like it was it was different. So it might be something you could you could um, how do you say change to quite easily. Cool. Hi, I, and, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, from what you said in the past few minutes and from what I experienced, it's something that I definitely will want to try more of, whether cool. it's half and half or, but it's something I'm, I, I'm, I wasn't willing to explore before, but I am now. So cool. Yeah. And once you, once you see more of the benefits, you'll want to keep going. Like it's easier to stay awake. Um, when we're working with certain kinds of practices, it keeps the mind very fresh. Um, and, um, and then, you know, and, and at least half open is really what, you know, half open is mostly what, you know, most lineages of Tibetan Buddhism suggest, at least working. For some people, half open is harder because it's hard to keep the eyes kind of relaxed and half open. So it, it's all about uh, the muscles around the eyes. I found really learning to relax them. Um, yeah uh lana anything around awareness or or how that went of connecting with awareness I, awareness came pretty good you know i almost i i almost want to say i i kind of managed to sustain it throughout so there but at some point it was kind of flickering in and out and i think it's exactly like you said it's like training the muscle you know when you overexert yourself you start to feel like it's trembling. And the same thing was with awareness as I was trying to, I, I wasn't really trying to put an effort into it, but it was just naturally kind of like, you know, 
like vibrating almost in and out. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's it. We kind of, we, we just train in it and it gets more, more familiar. And, you know, this, there's one key thing that might be helpful here too, which is this kind of shamatha, we, we relax a little bit more than normal. Like there's some styles of shamatha where they're a little bit more tense and aggressive. And, and there's some debate here because some people think it has more, it's more of a cultural distinction, meaning for Tibetans, They were, you know, in old Tibet, it was generally a very relaxed culture. They're very like rooted, earthy, bodied people, um, you know, nomads and and, and things like that. And so um, there was a little bit maybe more of a problem with dullness, where I think for the modern meditator, it's the opposite. We have a problem with too much excitement, you know, and almost like our dullness when we do get dull is usually coming from the nervous system being too activated in my experience. So we often need to relax it. And so, so that could be a, you know, that is a perspective. I I don't want to say there's one right answer there. Uh, But sometimes you see shamatha teachings be very aggressive with how single pointed we need to be. And some um, like you find in the Mahamudra traditions are more relaxed, right? And, and this, this goes all across all lineages, like the Mahamudra uh, shamatha I just shared with you all comes from this text from the Gluk tradition, from uh, Panchen Losan Losang Choki Choki Gelsen, um, Lami Eshe has just a great book. I think it's just called Mahamudra, and it's really simple, direct book. Um, very good, uh, really good support if you want to take this practice further. Um, but so my point is, uh, when we relax, the awareness is able to sustain more because we're kind of like pushing on it, and then that takes us out of the awareness. It's a lot like a glass of muddy water. And if we're constantly shaking that muddy water, the water's always going to be dirty. It's always going to be full of mud and we can't see the limpid quality of it. But if we put that glass down for long enough, the mud begins to settle to the bottom and we can start to see the limpid quality of the water. So that analogy is like the mind. You know, when we're shaking the mind, all day long through overthinking, through just being caught in habitual thinking, we can't connect with the, the backdrop or the, the, the nature of mind, which is the clarity, right? And the awareness. So, so some, that really helped me. There was a point in my practice where I shifted from like very pushy shamatha to relaxing a little bit more. And it really helped like like a ton like i mean it was like man i wish someone told me this earlier because <laughs> i beat my head against the wall for a lot of years um good um anyone else uh, just want to share anything around the practice i was going to say the only question i really had is what is the the name of the book is it just called mahamudra or I don't, do you know Dundra? I think it's just called Mahamudra um, by Lami Eshe. Let me look it up here. Um, it has like a subtitle, like. Um, oh, come on. Um, Was it How to Discover Our True Nature? Yep, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So I have yeah. it. Yeah, I just want to check to make sure. That yeah, that's the one. A, it's a really great book. When I when I teach the te- the text, I've taught it a few times. This text from the Panchen Lama, I'm often using this commentary, just because it's very pithy, direct, relatable. You know how Lama Yeshe was. Um, we also didn't get we didn't get really time to talk about Vipassana today because I also didn't I didn't want to go into a whole thing on Vipassana because that's really its own category and. Like would require another workshop at least, um, but the book does go into Mahamudra Vipassana too, because really, you know, I wanted to kind of end on that uh, this sense that um, uh, when if we really want to cut through clinging, that's Vipassana is really the methodologies to do that. But what we set up today, exploring shamatha a little bit more. <clears throat> If the shamatha isn't strong, the vipassana is going to be very difficult. And especially when it when it's within Mahamudra, there's an approach where it's like sort of like you you can't see deep deeper layers of the mind and attachment and how they're working until we've just saw the basic layer of 
clarity and awareness and have some ability and stillness and movement. And then we can start to look at the mind in attachment. We can start to look at the mind in aversion. We can set, start to look at how we hold uh, the self within, within the mind, right? How we cling to self within the mind. So, and that's where really the, the you know, as, as Lana brought up in the beginning, of today, that's really where where the practice is lie for cutting the root of, of attachment. Now, besides Mahamudra approaches of Vipassana, we also just have analytical approaches of Vipassana, which are incredibly beneficial. Usually, you know, for those of you who who, who aren't aware of them, we, we often do um, all of them. You know, so so a typical Tibetan Buddhist practitioner will will train in in, in analytical Vipassana. We'll train in, in elements of Vipassana and in, in tantric practice like Deity Yoga and other practices. And then Mahamudra is also kind of an in-between. There's Sutrana and, and tantric Mahamudra. But in general, the, the whole idea is we have to undermine the, the clinging to the belief that the object of our attachment is true and independent as it is or as it appears. That's really what we need to undermine. Right now I'm using... Uh, uh, more philosophical language or middle way language, but that's what that's what needs to happen because the whole premise here, when we go back to the beginning of today, is that um, it's not just from a Buddhist perspective getting rid of attachment or eliminating it or suppressing it. We need to see through that it exists in the way it appears. For a, for for for, for a, from a Buddha Dharma perspective, it always comes down to that because that is what frees us from the entanglement of samsara suppressing the attachment or you know having the like skillful means that that work with it more on a short-term basis those will help us to free up some space but they won't create the freedom or or bring about the freedom of of buddhahood or awakening so that's why i wanted to start today you know talking about buddha nature and i'll kind of end on that because it is our our essential nature our essential nature is free of this dualistic clinging, you know, it's just that we've become habituated to dualistic clinging, but it's not our nature. So we can counter that through shamatha and vipassana meditation. Oh, and I didn't talk about compassion, compassion as well, practicing, you know, the aspiration that ourselves and others can be free from suffering and its causes and embodying that as much as we can on a feeling level that that really cuts through attachment. So that's another skillful means. Doesn't quite cut the root like emptiness, but it does get us in the ballpark. It is one of those the, the package of Buddhism, the two wings of wisdom and means that 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 help us to travel to the fruition of of um, cutting through attachment. So I'll I'll kind of end there. And if there's just any any last minute things you all want to share and any questions, I know we've had a lot of time to discuss today. It's such a small group that we've had a lot of intimate time which is which is pretty cool i think that's kind of fun because we've gotten to know each other a little bit um but just anything before we close or on what i just said about vipassana or emptiness i want to comment on compassion i think it's very important to um discern the true compassion from what we used to which is a you know almost a guilt feeling because yeah. somebody suffering or uh, you know sometimes it's even up as superiority you know because you know they in that state and they they it's because of delusion and you know something that they don't so i think it's very 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 hard for me personally to cultivate that true compassion without those other you know you know like uh, you know unhealthy elements you know from is there anything you ca can re recommend any exercises for cultivation oh. of the true compassion yeah that's a great question i lost you for a second lana but then i think i think i didn't miss you were just talking about compassion and then, you know, losing, you know, people having, you know, having the wrong idea of compassion or going in the wrong direction. And so, so you're wondering, yeah, yeah, I think really, I mean, there's many ways, but I think the four, the four immeasurables, you know, um, are, are probably one of the main 
reflective practices we use, you know, to develop this. And so the four measurables are equanimity, uh, loving kindness, compassion, and um, em empathic joy or, or meditating on joy, you know, in others. And so the equanimity is kind of its own whole piece, right? And, and really important to develop as a preliminary for loving kindness and compassion. And then when we, when we get to the compassion part, it's really around this aspiration that I was saying that, you know, may you, or, you know, be free from suffering and its causes. So just the wording there changes it from that guilt aspect. It changes it from that superior aspect. Right. I mean, we can even say may we if you want. And, and the practice of that really comes down to, I think, imagining all the aspects of what you and other what, what you would like you and others to be free from, you know. And so for in Buddhist practice, this is vast because it goes from just, you know, the suffering of suffering, like I said earlier, to the suffering of change, to the pervasive suffering and all everything in between in the in the realms of samsaric experience or entanglement so so yeah that's how we would do it through the four measurables i mean i think that's one of the main practices um of course there's also like lojong practices like tong len and things like that but i think those get centered often uh when there's a lot of work to be done on the four measurables the four measurables is an incredibly rich practice that it's 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 contemplative essentially you know, but we can really bring it to a deep level because we have to bring it from intellectual contemplation to really feeling or evoking this deep non-referential or immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I love what you said that how all the other practices like feed that, that, you know, let's just call it like right compassion or great compassion. And I agree. And this is why I think it's like, you know, I'm not a big fan of taking meditation practices as techniques and sort of cherry picking them out and doing them on their own, because in Buddhism, they're, they're to be weaved in a whole context, you know, which includes like, you know, uh, uh, perspectives and worldviews that we need to reflect on. And, and I think that's when the practice has really become the most powerful, right? I, I think you're voicing that. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like that was yeah. in there. Yeah, it's kind of everything depends on the jazz and if when you miss one one component and then everything almost like it doesn't disintegrate, but it just loses its aim. You know, you know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so I would suggest exploring the four measurables more. There's there's commentaries on it. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff to start to get used to practice. You can reach out to me for more, more support in it if you want to. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else before we close up? It's feeling good. <laughs> Everybody feels you, you, you got something to work with, uh, to think about and work with attachment a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's dedicate the marriage. Uh, just before we dedicate, you all, you're always welcome to reach out with me, uh, reach out to me. Uh, probably my website is the best form for that. So it's just my name, uh, scotttusa.com, but it's like three T's in the URL because first and last name. Yeah. So feel free anytime. And thanks so much, Dundra, for the invitation and the and hosting and organizing and writing this description and all of it. <laughs> Thank you for accepting our invitation. Yeah, of course. All right, so we'll do a short dedication. There we go. Okay, so we'll just do it in English for the sake of time. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. We can keep going to the next one. Ooh, just down, yeah. 
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has not, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Yeah, we can do the long life prayers. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjana's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And we'll, we'll just end on His Holinesses today. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tens and Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Thanks so much, everyone. I, I enjoyed this. Um, and I just wish you all the best in your practice and, and Dharma studies. I enjoyed this also. I have to say I like the small groups. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.